Good morning. Good morning. Everyone nice and rested after missing out on an hour of sleep last night? I'll be watching to see who's dozing off this morning, and, and uh, I probably won't say anything, but maybe a loud scream just to, to jolt you. That'd be probably not good. Anyway, um, if you want to turn there, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We closed out uh, chapter 3 last week. And as we continue uh, through our series of talking about why the church, um, that will be also what we're discussing today. And I titled the message this morning, Christian Service Requires Humility. And as just a little bit of a recap to catch us up and make sure we're all up to speed, uh, especially for those who may not have been around for the last little while. Um, Paul is addressing believers here in, in this book. Um, Remember, Paul has spent probably a year and a half there as this church was established. So he has, he has a lot of people who he probably knows and that he's been around and has had influence on. A uh, year and a half, that's a pretty long time to, to have been uh, spent there as this church was established. Um, remember, the city of, of Corinth had a huge slave population, probably more slaves than actual citizens in that city. Paul is addressing problems that this church is having. Um, some of the things that have surfaced in this church, that there were factions of disunity. Um, they were f- making claims to follow certain of the leaders. I'm following Paul. No, I'm following Apollos. Um, and, it, and it created some divisions in that church. Um, they were forsaking godly wisdom and relying on a worldly wisdom. They were denying the power of the cross. And these were just some of the issues that Paul was dealing with. Last week, we were encouraged to examine how we build. The church's foundation was talked about needs to have Christ as that cornerstone, that foundation, and built upon Jesus Christ. And if you remember the image that was up on the screen behind us, it had that big cathedral. And then right next to it, it had the dilapidated house. And the difference of that stark imagery in our minds of understanding how When we are building our foundation firmly upon Christ, that would almost resemble what that big cathedral, that magnificent edifice would look like. When the church uh, focuses on that foundation of Christ, both individually as well as collectively as a church body, that we will never regret acts of service done for Christ. And again, I really enjoyed the point of the list that was put up on the board that I don't know about you, but anytime I have been able to serve and be a part of serving someone or others, I've never regretted that. At the time, it may seem a little bit you're being put out, but after the fact, I could honestly say I've never regretted being involved with service. That's going to kind of bring us to where we are today. We're going to pick up um, right after chapter three. And if you'll remember, the very end of chapter 3, um, Paul is writing, um, Paul, Apollos, or Cephas, he talks about life or death, he talks about the present or the future, he says that it's all yours, and it's who you are, it's your inner being, it's what you've become, it's kind of like building or erecting that big edifice, and if its foundation is on Jesus Christ, that imagery should stick with us to understand that all of these things are part of us and part of who you are, part of this church also. And he goes and finishes up by saying, and you are Christ and Christ is of God. And that leads us right into chapter four, where he picks up and he says, so then, and understanding that idea that we are all part of Christ and Christ is in us and our foundation is built in Christ. So then is where we're going to pick up reading today. So let's go to the text. Chapter four of first Corinthians. This, then, is how you ought to regard us, as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries of God, uh, the mysteries God has revealed. Now, it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. 
Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. Now, brothers and sisters, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written. Then you will not be puffed up in inner puffed up in being a follower of one of us over against the other. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. You have begun to reign, and that without us. How I wish that you really had begun to reign, so that we also might reign with you. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of a procession, like those condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to human beings. We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored, we are dishonored. To this very hour we go hungry and thirsty, we are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our hands. We, when we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. And when we are slandered, we answer kindly. We have become the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world, right up to this moment. I am writing this not to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. And for this reason, I have sent to you Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. Some of you have become, have become arrogant as if I were not coming to you, but I will come to you very soon if the Lord is willing, and then I will find out not only how these arrogant people are talking, but by what power they have. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. What do you prefer? Shall I come to you with a rod of discipline, or shall I come in love and with a gentle spirit? That's the entire chapter there, and there's a lot in here. We're not going to cover everything today, but I think there's three main topics that I want us to take away today as we look at this scripture. These three separate ideas are very interrelated. And in additionally, it's reinforcing the first three chapters that we've looked at throughout 1 Corinthians so far. As he starts out, this then is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. As you think back to the idea that there were those factions of people wanting to follow certain leaders, he's trying to dispel that fact that there's one leader that's more important than the other. But what he's really getting at is he's saying, we're all servants. And he even earlier in chapter three talked about that, where he said in verse five of chapter three, what after all is Apollos and what is Paul? We're only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord assigned each to his task. Paul is trying to make the connection between what he and the other apostles are doing, what they've done, and that they're just being servants. Almost like saying, we're ordinary people. Nothing special about us. We're servants. And as we in our human terms would look back on the apostles, we would say, They've done pretty amazing things. I don't look at them as just being servants. Servants in the households in the city of Corinth were actually given pretty high responsibilities. It was noted that these servants were known as stewards of the households. They were put in charge of managing the family's affairs, dealing with children, helping them get to their schools that they would take them to, and helping them with educational questions that they may have. As Paul expounds on this idea that we're just servants, I think that gives the Corinthians a bigger picture of what they were 
what they, the apostles, were trying to achieve and accomplish. They were being like those um, servants themselves of wanting to help them as being good stewards, good stewards for the church, good stewards to lift people up and encourage them. As we think through the idea of today we're having uh, ordination of some ministers, I would encourage those brothers to think through that, to understand that you're being stewards of God's word. Second Corinthians 5 verse 20, it says, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though Christ were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Christ's ambassadors, that was Paul's goal in everything that he did in the city of Corinth when he was there for a year and a half instructing them. He was being ambassador for Christ. Those of us who stand up front here are given an assignment to be ambassadors for Christ. Those of you sitting in the pews, if you call yourself a Christ follower, you are being called to be an ambassador for Christ. It's not the person up front that's giving a sermon on a Sunday morning. It's not necessarily the person in back during a Bible study who's leading that Bible study. The people downstairs teaching Sunday school are in back doing junior church. We're all called to be ambassadors for Christ. We're giving a message. We need to speak to that hope that lies within each of us. First Peter 4.10 says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Again, it's not just for those who are standing up front speaking on a Sunday morning. We're all called to be faithful stewards, to use the gifts that have been given to us to serve others and to speak to God's grace and how it's affected our lives. I really like how Paul goes on to kind of close out his first thought here. He goes on to say, I don't care if you judge me. I don't care if a court judges me. I don't even judge myself. Christ is the judge. Paul knows that if he is stewarding God's mysteries in a faithful way, he has nothing to worry about. In the end, Christ will be the judge. And he actually knows our hearts. Christ knows what is inside of us. He knows our motives, the actions behind what we do. Again, I stop and I pause and I think, what are our motives? What does that look like for us, knowing and understanding that ultimately we could fool everybody in this world around us? But in the end, Christ is going to be the judge. He knows our motives. What gives us the desire behind what we do? Is it an outward show? I hope not. I don't think it was the apostles' idea of what they did, that it was just an outward show. Their motives were rooted in that foundation of Christ. It motivated them to do what they did for the gospel. I hope that's our motive here this morning. And as I think through the three people who were going to be ordained, that would be your motive. Make Christ known. In all you do and in all you say, and focus on those mysteries of the gospel. Let's continue through the text. The second thought Paul starts to address what wrong motives look like in these believers. These wrong motives, I believe, kept crept into the Corinthian church. He goes on, verse 6, Now, brothers and sisters, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit. And again, these things would be that idea of being good stewards of God's word. So that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written. Then you will not be puffed up in being a follower of one of us over against the other. Do not go beyond what is written. Stick to God's word. Make the gospel known. Remember, the gospel is the good news. What is that good news? Well, that good news is Jesus Christ. As Paul continues to address some of the things going on there, I really like these next few verses because sometimes we think 
of Paul or some of the apostles and those pillars that we would look at in the Bible is, uh, I don't even know what the right word is, but kind of being laid back champions for the gospel. But I really love how Paul brings out this little bit of sarcasm in these verses, these next few verses. Verse seven, who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. You have begun to reign. And that without us, how I wish you really had begun to reign so that we also might reign with you. I think in Paul's sarcasm, he's kind of trying to draw out those Corinthians t- believers to understand, hey, you've let pride into your life. You've let some things carry you away, move you off of that foundation of Jesus Christ. When pride rises up in our life, we tend to think, yeah, we got everything taken care of. Remember, uh, the city of Corinth was a very affluent city, um, very wealthy in what they did in the surroundings around them. Paul's reminding them, hey, you're really not mature. And we read about that in the first part of chapter three when he talked about you guys aren't mature in your faith. He's reminding them, get off of your high horse. You're not there yet. You haven't arrived. It made me stop, pause a little bit because in North America, in our country here, we have so much, so much that oftentimes if you're like me, that I fail to recognize comes from God and Christ living in me. Pride creeps in. We don't even hardly know it. Paul is addressing that in their lives. I pray that we would examine our lives and think through that of what it looks like for us. Have we let pride creep into our lives? Has it carried us off of where we need to be? Has it moved our church off of the foundation of Christ? Has it moved you personally away from where Christ wants you to be. Pride had crept in to the church at Corinth. They lost focus of what it meant to correctly handle the word of God. It became about them and who they followed and less about Christ and the good news. And remember the good news is Jesus Christ. Romans 12, 3 For by grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. That sober judgment this morning, I hope we would all stop and just consider our lives. Have we let pride creep into our lives? Sober judgment. As we think through this idea, again, I refer to the idea of pride creeps in and we don't even know it. When we're standing up here in front, giving a sermon, pride wants to creep in. When we're leading a Bible class, pride wants to creep in. When we're talking to our neighbor across the street, pride wants to creep in. When we're sitting with family at a Christmas dinner and discussions are going around, pride wants to creep in. Our foundation on Jesus Christ, the building of of that edifice focused on Christ is what's going to keep pride from creeping into our lives. Continuing on, verse 14. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. For this reason, I have sent to you Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere and in every church. I love this idea to follow Paul's example as he's imploring the people there. Imitate me. It's what I teach in every church. He's a faithful steward. 1 Corinthians 11 says, follow me, follow my example. Galatians 4, become like me. Philippians 3 and chapter 4, 
Join together in following my example. Whatever you learned, received, or heard from me, put into practice. 1 Thessalonians 1, you became imitators of us and the Lord. 2 Thessalonians 3, we offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate. Paul lived out the gospel as a way of life. It wasn't something he did just on a Sunday morning. He wasn't perfect. He knew that. That was clear also in this chapter when he talked about having a clear conscience in those first few verses. He knew in the end Christ would be the judge of his his motives, but he was faithful to the gospel, the good news, the message of Jesus. What would you like to imitate that Paul did in your lives? I sat and I thought about that for a moment. And I asked that question, and as you sit there in the pew, most of us who have been around God's word and understand Paul's life, and we've seen snippets of that, what about Paul would you like to imitate? There were many things that came to my mind. give you a second to pause and ponder that. Paul closes out these final thoughts. Verse 20 says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. This is one of the things that I really admired about Paul. He circles back to speak to the power found in the gospel message. Paul knew that a life focused on the gospel would be changed by the power found in the message. 1 Corinthians 2.4, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 4 and 5, for we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you, Because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. And in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, we read, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. Paul's message was Christ. He knew that in preaching Christ, there was power. It wasn't about how he said things. It wasn't about a dynamic speaker. It wasn't about great stories that he told. He knew that power was founded in the word of God. For us today, we need to understand and believe that same power is there for us. The power of the gospel that changes lives. The old passes away. The new comes out in us. Because of Christ's power living in us, we're able to face life. We're able to deal with anxieties. We're able to deal with shortcomings when we fall and when we sin. Christ is there to pick us up. That power comes to give us the strength that we need daily to meet those challenges ahead of us whatever those might be. And I would encourage you this morning that if you've never made that commitment to Christ to understand where that power lies and what kind of power that could bring to your life, know that Christ is here for you today. He wants to come create a new life in you. Put the old away and start the new. Every morning as believers, when we get up in the morning, we're starting anew, so to speak. Do we focus on Christ? Do we tap into his power? Do we check ourselves and make sure we're humbly proceeding through God's grace? And are we serving and being example to those around us? Pray that God would bless the word this morning. Mm -hmm.